while the dogs eat their bones. And boy, are they chowing down. I'm going to eat this is Penny Popo. And after reading about it a lot as I'm working on the Swamele books, I decided, you know what? I'm making some. So tonight, while I'm editing this video, I'm making this and we're, you're going to come along for the ride because why not? But this is it all done. It's all soaked in coconut milk. It is a sweet roll that is baked in coconut syrup and then some more poured on top. So let's do this thing and let's talk about these books. Well, March was a good month. My first good month of the year. Got lots read. I have some still in progress. I'm still got like, I think tonight I'll finish uh, Dr. Thorne. And I haven't read much more of the um, Baron's Apprentice. Yes, the Baron's Apprentice. I haven't read much more of that one yet. But I've already gotten started on some April books. And I finished a lot of other books. And according to Goodreads, I'm only two behind my challenge, which is really weird because I was like, I don't know, a month ahead almost at the end of January last year. It was crazy. So the difference is kind of crazy, but that's okay because I mean, it's about reading, right? And you got to do what you got to do. And this is what I did and we, we, we're going to do it. And that makes no sense whatsoever, but I'm okay with that because of reasons, right? So, um, my Chantal Reads All Day book for the month was The House on Foster Hill by Jamie Jo Wright. I had read some of this, but not nearly as much as I thought. I thought I had gotten close to finishing it, or I had even finished it, but too fast to remember? No, no. That, that's not true. Where are my scissors? There they are. That's not true. Um, there was way too much of it that I didn't. So, that's kind of cool, because then it felt like a pretty much a new book to me. There. Now my little tabby is not sticking out so far. So that's good, right? Right? I think this book has a lot of strengths that I haven't heard people talk about, which I thought I wanted to mention. Like, one of them is the pacing. The pacing was excellent on this thing. I mean, like, Ivy, is her name Ivy? Her name's Ivy, isn't it? Ivy? Yeah. Ivy, I didn't like Ivy. I wanted to slap her most of the time. I... I understood her. I still wanted to slap her most of the time. I mean, she was, she, I get really tired of people who take something that someone has done as a very young adult or a teenager and build a case against them in their mind and then later as adults are still holding it against them. Like, we don't grow up. You know, and since she hadn't ha been able to, and don't get me wrong, this part of it isn't her fault. Since she hadn't been able to talk to this person about it, she hadn't been able to talk to him. She hadn't been able to get a full story. And that, that's real. And again, though, she, it wasn't, it wasn't, and, and I got to say, I'm saying all these things about a character. That doesn't mean I have a problem with the book. It's just, this is my, why I want to smack the character, you know, but like, when she has a chance to actually talk to this person and find out what on earth was going on and all that good stuff. Yeah, she didn't do it. She, she's like still holding a grudge 10 some odd years later. I'm like, why? Just why? And so I wanted to smack her, but it made for a really good story because A, this is how people react. This is how people respond. And B, you know, but... What Jamie Jo does so well, and I saw in this one, is she knows how to take what happened in the past and give us a story and get, take what's happening now and give us a story and then slowly draw those stories together so you can't take them apart and still have them make sense. And she just, she did it really, really well. Do I think this will be my favorite of her books? I doubt it. But I don't care. You can't, they all can't be favorites or they all have to be favorites, right? And so because of this, I'm like, yeah, because yeah. So I don't know. I really loved it. And I mean, I gave it five stars. And I think, yes. And I loved the faith in it. And the fact that the faith wasn't 
um, the faith wasn't predictable. The faith wasn't trite. It had depth and layers and faults because we do. So Jamie did a great job and I'm not surprised by that at all, but it's super cool to see. And so I'm glad I, I actually finally got it written, but this was my Chantal reads all day it had, I think it had to have a house on the cover. And so I figure that's a house. It's even in the title, but that staircase, piano. Um, th there were little elements in here, like the piano and the, um, there's a, a book in here. How she used both of those was really cool. There's a painting in here and a quilt in here. And how she used all of those was super, super cool. How she used the house was super cool. And yeah, I called it on who was what. And I felt like I was really smart. And then I didn't. I got, I, I got part of it wrong, but I got the general right. And yet... I didn't think I was right. I was spitballing, and but I called it anyway. And so I'm like, that was kind of cool. I mean, I was right and wrong at the same time, but for the most part, I was right. And that was cool, you know, just because I didn't know if I was just making stuff up out of thin air or what. So that was, that was kind of neat. But I mean, she puts it all in there so you can figure it out if you pay attention. And so that, that I really love. But yeah, House on Foster Hill, that was my first one. Okay, the next one I listened, I, I listened to it was A Shadow on the Snow by J.P.C. Allen. I gave it four and a half stars, rounded up to five, because I'm pretty sure I had to give the paperback five stars. But I have to say the narrator wasn't my favorite. She wasn't horrible. It's just, I think as a person, she just wasn't the right one for me. But I don't know that most people would have a problem with her. It just, that definitely affected the enjoyability of it. But it's also had, it's the first book in a series. It has a novella that is a prequel that's in a set with a couple other authors. Personally, having done this, um, I made, I knew about this novella. I knew it was probably a good idea to read it first. And I made the choice not to because I wanted to listen. And I don't think that that novella has an audio. I could be wrong about that, but I was in a place where I need to do this now. So I got it going. And if I had it to do over, I would listen to that again. I was never lost in the story at all. She pulls enough of her background back in, you know, uh, Jennifer, I think her name is. She pulls her enough of the background in so that you're not lost. But that being said, I feel like it would have been a richer read. Like, I wouldn't be getting... You know how when, you, when you're, you go into a group of friends and they're all talking about the past and they're telling you enough of what they're laughing and joking about that you can follow it, but you can tell you're missing the richness because you weren't there? Yeah, it's kind of the same thing. And so for that... I'm like, eh, I wish I had, I wish I had read it first. So if you're going to read the series, um, absolutely, I would recommend it. It's a Riley, a Ray Riley mystery. So they're mysteries. They are, um, fair play mysteries and that you can figure it out. You can follow it and that's good. But this one, it, they're, they're YA. They don't feel YA. They're not like YA angsty. There's even like in this one. Any hints of romance are just that. They're hints. And it's it's over, spread over a, a, a group of people. So there's there, it's not going anywhere. I'm just saying, you know, there's nothing so far. And that's kind of nice because then the focus is on the mystery and not on some relationship, right? But it is also focused on relationships because in, before this book takes place, Ray... And it's in that Christmas book, Ray has, um, her mother has died and given her clues to which of three men her father could be. She's never known her father. Her father tried to kill her, they think. Her father tried to kill her and her mother while her mother was pregnant with her one night. And so she's trying to find out who this, who this father is. And then, but in this book, you kick off, you know who it is, which is why I have to be really careful what I say. Um, because if you want to read that other one first and find out who the dad is, you're going to need to, you know, me not to spoil it. But in this one, uh, someone is 
trying to put a stop to her relationship with her father. And in doing that, they're, they're making threats against her father and his family. They're making threats against her. They're kind of terrorizing her. So it's a little bit of a suspense in that she's kind of got a stalker and a mystery at the same time, and you're trying to solve it. There was a lot of really good. The faith was strong without being preachy. I just had a lot of about it that I loved. Is it the best mystery I've read this year? Not even close, but I loved it and I wanted to read more. So there's that. Uh, Shadow on the Snow, I think is what it's called again. Let me go back. Yeah. Shadow on the Snow. And I listened to it. And like I said, I personally would recommend reading it with a physical book or an ebook. I, the narrator just didn't do anything for me. Next up, I read Emma and the Reasons, and can I just say, I've owned this book for, I think since it came out, so that's like 2018, I've owned this book for a long time, and I finally read it, and now I'm like dying to read the next book. <laughs> um, this one might be my favorite, if it's not my favorite, it is one of my favorites of the month, definitely, it's like top two if it's not the top. This was so good. So in Emma and the Reasons, they have two, there's a friend group. They have the marrieds who were once single and now they paired off and eventually married. And then they have these three roommates, Emma and her two friends, and they call themselves the Reasons because they have reasons that they are still single and they are happy to be single. And then this one is about how things, oh, that's an A for a second. I thought that was a two and I'm like, wait, what? <laughs> but there are, you know, men are coming around showing interest and they're getting a little suspicious about it. They're like, what's going on here? And then you discover that, guess what? The marrieds have a bet going as to which one they can get married off first. And the reasons are not happy. <laughs> but also, what, what, what Natasha did so cool in here. There's technically a, a love triangle going on, and I didn't mind it at all. As a matter of fact, it made total sense. It fit, and it fit because of what the story was, and it fit in a way that you could tell nobody's going to be really hurt by this, which was also really cool. Can I just say that was also really cool? Um, but... In, in Emma and the Reasons, Emma's a social worker and she pours herself into children in the neighborhood and to her uh, charges, you know, whoever she's been assigned to. And the way she is just immersed in her job and in her faith and the discipleship program that she and her roommates have for the young women at church, can I just say, we need more of these. Um, and in here, something, something happened that I'm a little confused about. So I would have been almost tempted to take us at least half a star off of this book, usually. Usually, this would really bother me. Because in here, you get the sense that God is speaking directly to her about things in her life. Not, not feeling nudges per se, but actual, you know, telling her what to do and what not to do. And I have a problem with that, usually. Um, like, in the Dragon Lady book, I it was really bothered when uh, it was almost an audible God saying something. And I'm like, really? It's just how I understand scripture. I know people disagree with me. I'm okay with that. But because of how I understand scripture, it's like it violates my conscience when I read something and like it and, you know, agree with it when it's doing this, right? So I'm trying to figure this out. My brain was really doing a lot of things because in here it didn't bother me. And I finally think I figured out why. I was talking to my daughter about it and we both kind of came to the same conclusion and it's it's kind of weird so here's the deal I just saw in the mirror that my window is crooked 
Um, but here's the deal. In this one, it feels almost like a fantasy element. Almost like, and I'm wondering if this is why sometimes in books it doesn't bother me and other times it does. Because it's not written like it's a fantasy element at all. It's not. But in fantasy, things can happen that can't happen in real life. And we don't get worked up about it. And I wonder if that's not why I didn't get worked up about it. Because in my mind, this is a literary device to demonstrate something. You know what I mean? That is happening in the heart. But it's... If Natasha agrees with me biblically, and I don't know that she does or doesn't, but if she does, the only way to show what would be happening in the heart would be to show it the way she did it. And if Natasha actually believes that God is speaking to people this way, that's between her and the Lord. I'm not going to argue with her, but it still came off to me as a literary device to show what's happening in the heart, um, show what's happening with discernment and prayer and whatever that is much more literal than maybe I or people who think like I do would expect. And so I'm wondering, how often do I get bothered by a book when maybe the author is just using a literary device and or maybe that's how I need to see it. I need to see it as a literary device so that I'm not potentially condemning something in a book that wasn't meant to be or to keep it fit with my personal uh, understanding of scripture. But then I wonder about, you know, baby Christians. And then it's like, that's none of my business. <laughs> so there was a lot going into this and there was a lot to think about. But when it boils down to it, loved the book and was totally, totally, totally encouraged in my faith, in my, you know, it definitely drove me to the word, which is very important. And it ended exactly how I wanted it to. And few authors would have done it. And that's all I'm saying. I was thrilled with this book. Then I read Good Night, Mr. Tom. And my husband and I watched the movie. I'm just going to say right off. I personally wouldn't bother with the movie. I feel like it stripped the richness of this story and made it kind of trite. I'm just putting that out there. But, um, Good Night, Mr. Tom by Michelle Magorian. Where has this book been and why have I not read it? And I kind of feel like I should smack my daughter for not forcing me to read it. But I won't because, yeah. So, in this one, Mr. Tom has been a recluse pretty much since his wife and child died. In comes World War II, they evacuate the children, and Willie, Will William, uh, Will is sent to the countryside, and his mother has requested slash required that he be in a very godly, God-fearing family and or near a church. She's very religious and wants all the religion pounded into this boy, literally. Um, she sends the belt that he will need because he's a very simple or horrible little boy. Yeah, he's not. He's a very sweet boy. He's a, he's been battered. This child has been abused beyond comprehension. I just, you, you, you see things like this and you're like, why, why would your parents do this? I don't understand. <sighs> well, This kid has lots of problems, and Mr. Tom is so good at just calmly and matter-of-factly helping him work through those problems, and I loved that. And then when the mother insists that he come home, you know, Mr. Tom is like, hey, you need to, you know, write me. I need to know that you're okay, you know, because he knows what this boy's going home to, right? doesn't hear a word, and finally goes after him, brings him back, and it's just this whole story. It's beautiful, horrible, horrible, but beautiful at the same time. And, uh, but there are three things in this book that I feel like I have to mention for parents. It wasn't a problem for me, 
but as a parent, I would have wanted to know. So the first one is there is a very frank discussion of sex between a young boy who is a friend of Williams and William. And um, it's slightly inaccurate, which is one of the main reasons I would want parents to know it. But it is delightfully discreet. In my opinion, and I was really careful with what my kids read when they were little, I would have let them read this book, I think. There, there, there's one part that I wouldn't have been real happy about. I'll get to that in a minute. But as far as this goes, wouldn't have had a problem with it. It was delightfully discreet. But the problem is <clears throat> that it is slightly inaccurate. But it was done very discreetly. And the point, there was a good point to it. You know, William has this idea that, you know, this is all evil and horrible and terrible and... This kid is just like, eh, this, this is normal, you know, it's no big deal. And it wasn't like he's, it, it was, it was in a natural conversation. They weren't talking about forbidden topics. They weren't, it wasn't anything like that. It was very natural and understandable. And I had no problem with it except for the inaccuracy of it, which is, was kind of smart of the author. Can I just say, because how often do kids get it wrong? Right. But then, um, then there's a second one, which again, I thought was, E, that one in particular was essential to the story. It was essential to Will's growth and healing. But the, the local teacher has to feed her baby and she just unbuttons and, and, and it describes it. She just unbuttons her blouse, whips it out and feeds the baby. And this kid is just staring and watching this like, you know, but I can't tell you why, but it's very healing to him. And it's important to the story. Had really had no problem with those two. The third one was completely unnecessary. I understood why she put it in because, especially when this was written, that was pretty common to just kind of acknowledge changes and everything. But he and his friend are rushing in, they're changing clothes, and he notices that she's got bumps. And I'm like, that was unnecessary. There was really no point to it. And it bothered me. But not enough to, to cut anything off. I gave it five stars. I absolutely loved it. And I'm going to see if she's written anything else. Because, yeah, yeah. If you know of anything else she's written, I want to know what I should read. Because that book was amazing. I loved it. Okay, so I finally got to read the next Benedict Brown, What the Vicar Saw. Oh, my gravy. This is his best one so far, I think. This one got me. I absolutely had it wrong the whole time. I think I was a little too married to my own theory, which was kind of cool uh, because I I would, I was so on it. I was like, this is it. And I stuck to my guns the whole way and I was all wrong. And that was really cool. But also he kind of mixed it up a little bit in this one. There were slight differences, which was kind of cool. And, um, and in this one, there are some faith elements in here that are pretty cool. And I have no idea what Benedict Brown's faith personally is, if he has any, if he just has a tradition, I don't know. But in this one, anyone who has a strong faith is going to get a little bit of, of feeding into that, and which was cool. I mean, the narrator did a great job. I mean, um, he's saying, guide me, O thou great, they say Redeemer, we sing Jehovah here, but, you know, in, in our church. But, um, he, you know, he sings part of that. And, I mean, they just, it was so cool to see, why someone is dying, how they're dying, what's happening, who's doing it, all the stuffness. And that was cool. It was, I like I said, it, I think it's his best. Loved it. And again, I can't wait for the next one. It's like this, this narrator can't read them fast enough for me. It's like the second I know there's another one out, I'm on it. It's like, give me that book. So, um, What the Vicar Saw by Benedict Brown. Absolutely, totally recommend it. Everybody's not going to love them like I do, but I find them really, really fun. They have the feel of a golden age, but with a humorous twist. It's almost like if you put kind of a, a Christy feel with like the, the marble or tuppence, Tommy and Tuppence side of things, not quite as 
Um, but, but you know, there's also some Poirot in Lord Edgington. So maybe just kind of like that kind of feel of those detectives that she's got. But with kind of a, a healthy dose of like T.E. Kinsey with the humor and the... So there's that, you know, for what it's worth. Uh, look at the UPS guys out there, but it shouldn't be for me. We'll see. Anyway, and then I read... Guys, I have been waiting to, uh, 10 years, I think it's been. I think it's been 10 years for this book. And I got it. <laughs> so um, Denise Colby sent me an arc of her upcoming release. It comes out in June when plans go awry. And I, I, I got this and I was like, I, I was praying the whole time it was coming. I was like, Lord, please let me love this book. <laughs> because, you know, you get a book. I mean, I get arcs. I'm not afraid to say what I think about them. But when I get an arc, especially an arc, from a friend... And she is a friend. I Like I said, I've known her for 10 years. I, you, you get nervous because what if you don't like it anymore? You know, because I've only known what little bits she's shared. And so I'm like, what if I don't like it anymore? And what if... No worries. It was so good. So in this one, Olivia Carmichael. Yeah, Carmichael. Um, she was well off in Ohio. Her parents died, she was left with nothing, and she was rejected by all her friends because now she has nothing. Fiance dumped her and the works. So she goes to, you know, be trained to be a teacher, and she comes out to California, and she's going to teach in this little town of Washburn and, no, not Washburn, Washington, because it was Washington, but they left out the ing after a while. If I recall correctly. But anyway, so she comes and she's going to be the teacher. The The rules say that she uh, can't marry for a year and a bunch, of, a bunch of other rules. And she's like totally fine with that because she's done with men. And she wants to be independent because people will hurt you. And you can see why she feels that way. She feels betrayed by her parents. She feels betrayed by her friends, her fiance, and by God. So you have her. Then you have Luke and his two little sisters um, Luke, his father and a friend's daughter and a friend's parents, they all died way back. And then, um, the, the, those parents, kids came to live with Luke and his mom and his siblings. And then after, after that, the mom wanted the, the young woman and Luke to get married to take care of the sisters because she was dying. Gal takes off. She doesn't do it. So now he's alone with these sisters and someone has convinced him that he needs a mail order bride to come and take care of the sisters. So he does it because he's got to do what he's supposed to do. So there's already this setup, right? The community is rich in faith. They are very strong faith filled and she's expected to go to church. And she's got these, these students that she's absolutely in love with. She's just, she really is a good teacher and so you've got this, all this town dynamic. The men in the town are like, here's another single woman. There's no single women around. They're all buzzing. And it's just, it's, it's kind of stressful and kind of, you know, she's obviously, you know, there's going to be this attraction with Luke and you know that this, because it's clearly historical romance, right? So, you know, that's coming, but you don't know how, because he's got this, this mail order bride coming and how's that going to work out? And I had an assumption as to what Colby was going to do with it. And she didn't. She did something totally different, super unique, super fun. But seriously, I feel guilty for saying this, but my absolutely favorite character in this book was a rooster. I think his name is Bertie, Bernie, Bertie, Bernie, Ernie, Bernie. It's either Bertie or Bernie, I'm pretty sure. But this rooster is a hoot. He thinks he's a shepherd dog and an alarm clock and a timer all in one. He just like, he like hustles the kids up to school because you're getting late. And he like hustles her home when the storm is coming. I mean, he's just got his opinions and he is like, uh, it's so funny. But both Luke and Olivia have issues with God and trust and problems for different reasons. And they handle them in different ways, but they both have to deal with their issues and that's really what the book is about. And it, it was a good story. The faith content was strong and beautiful and relatable and you could learn from. But it was funny. And yeah, it, it it's your typical romance. And that's not normally 
my, you know, my go-to thing. But when someone takes a normal romance and then gives it a lot of rich layers and depth and stuff, I'm all, I'm all in. Give, give me the, because it's not just guy meets girl and how are we going to make this happen? You know, there's just way more to the story than that, which I loved. So yeah, when plans go awry, I believe it comes out in, um, June. Then I read Insignificant Events in the Life of a Cactus. I now understand the title of it. I want to say, hey, yo, why on earth didn't she name her blog this? But I get why she didn't. But I don't. But I do. But I don't. That would have been a great name for her blog. Can I just say? But So it's by Dusty Bowling. And it's I understand this, uh, this girl in in different ways i you know i have both of my arms she doesn't have any arms um she's only moved once i moved all the time but i did live in the same area that she moves to do you understand the being the new kid and and feeling strange in a strange place but i love that i i wish i had her resilience and her personality and because you know they they give up the parents a lot the, the author and the and even herself give her parents a lot of credit for why she is the way she is and they they deserve the credit they have earned that but it's also partly her personality and you you discovered that later and she discovers that later and that's kind of good for her too to figure out that it's not all her parents greatness some of it is just because this is she wouldn't say this because it's not a Christian fiction book, but it's how God made her, you know. But so in this one, again, she has no arms. She moves to Arizona to run this like Western theme park place with her parents. And while she's there, she discovers a mystery. There, there are things that don't make sense and she's trying to figure it out. Meanwhile, you know, she has no arms. So she has to eat with her feet, which means she has to wash her feet before she can eat, which means that she's already late starting meals, but then everybody's staring at her. So she finally goes and, and she's going to eat in the bathroom, but that's gross. So she's not going to do that anymore. And then she, it's just like this cycle. Well, she meets uh, Connor. I think Connor's his name. Connor has Tourette's. And so he barks a lot and he spits when he eats his food. And so he doesn't eat with the other kids. He doesn't eat at school at all. Um, she, then she meets Zion. Zion is fat. So he doesn't want people watching him eat. And I'm just going to say fat because you know what? Sorry. The, the kid's fat. Some kids, especially at that age, are. And then they slim down once they go through their major growth spurt. I have a friend whose entire family of boys did this. They all got huge. And then, boom, they're like rails overnight. It was unbelievable. But their girls did it. The boys did it. It's it just, it's how some kids do things. Will he do that? I don't know. But sometimes I think we need to, like, give kids a break. <sighs> okay, I'm fine. I'm fine. Everything's fine. <laughs> but anyway, um, in here, they, they kind of create this little threesome and uh, spend time together. They, they go with him to, Con to some meetings for Connor and this is where step one you go to a Tourette's meeting there is a kid if you have if you've got a kid who tends to pick up on the silly and run with it and never stop there are some kids that do this and it becomes like an issue the parents have to actually deal with it if you've got a kid like this this might not be the book for him because this one poor kid with Tourette's to demonstrate how sometimes they say completely inappropriate things you know, sometimes they're swearing, sometimes they're saying very vulgar things. Well, to demonstrate that, the author uses chicken nipple. And this kid just can't help but say chicken nipple all the time in the middle of a sentence. And it's it's constant. And you know how some kids are, you know, so I'm just warning you, uh, you it's in there. But I didn't have a problem with it. I did, I kind of say, I did mark something. What is this? I saw Connor walking over the bridge that connected the parking lot to the park. The bridge was built to go over a wash. Washes are like empty riverbeds that run all over North Scottsdale so that when it rains, the water can flood the city in an orderly manner. Yeah, that's, that's, that's pretty much what a desert wash is. <laughs> So, but it was, it was such a good story. It, I love her parents. I love Avon. I love her friends and how it, when things get hard, they still, 
you know, th there's a one point where they have this disagreement, but they still work together eventually and things work out and they, and it kind of shows that I, I can't give away anything, but there's more to the story than you think there's going to be right up to the end. And I loved it. And I've got the next book coming because I want to know, tell me the next book is this good. I, I Please, I need to know this. All right. So I, the next one I read was Barchester Towers by Anthony Trollope. So I got February's finally done. And this one, I, I have four. I'm going to see. I have four things that I marked. In this one, by the end of it, so it started off really slow. I was like, oh, why do you do this to me? I don't re I just, no. But then it picked up again, as usual. I didn't have that problem with Dr. Thorne. I, that one started off pretty much right from the beginning. Trollope really loves to, and it was somewhere around, so we're, in, we're about to start chapter nine. It was somewhere around here um, when things started picking up, started, but they didn't really pick up until like 200 pages into this thing. It was crazy. But there's a few quotes in here again that were great. And one of them is, Mr. Harding says, believe me, my child, the Christian ministers are never called on by God's word to insult the convictions or even the prejudices of their brethren, and that religion is at any rate not less susceptible of urbane and courteous conduct among men than any other study which men may take up. And... The, the word there is insult. Not necessarily we aren't to confront wrong. That's not what he's saying. But he's saying insult. In other words, don't, we're, as Christians, and he's saying ministers, but I think it applies to all of us. We're not supposed to uh, insult people and go down to, you know, a petty level. We talk and we confront and we, you know, deal with the issue, sure. But insult is, that becomes a sin for us. So that was good. And then it said, wars about trifles are always bitter, especially among neighbors. When the differences are great and the parties comparative strangers, men quarrel with courtesy. What combatants are ever so eager as two brothers? And I was like, you know, like there's nothing new under the sun. I mean, it's, it's like, we're back to it again. I, it was, it was so good. And I was like, yeah, because yeah. And then... And then the one that was my favorite quote of the whole book, it is so good. It is, it's one of those truths that it like comes in a circle. It's true. It's more true today. It's less true today. It's more, it, it was so good. It says, I think the world grows more worldly every day. And the response is, that is because you see more of it than when you were younger. Hey, Neville, lay down. But we should hardly judge by what we see. We see so very little. If we believe in scripture, we can hardly think that mankind in general will now be allowed to retrograde <laughs> like it hasn't been all along, right? But the point being that, you know, when when you're younger, the world doesn't seem as bad as it does when, when you're, you know, like when you're an eight-year-old, it doesn't seem as bad as it does when you're like 16 and the world is coming to an end because you don't get your way on something. And then, you know, you're 25 and you're having to see the realities of adulthood. And then you're 40 and your kids are growing up and you're realizing just what a place, you know, it has become. And then when you're 80 and you're like, the world has gone to pot, what's going on? Well, but is it any different or are you just able to see more? The older you get, the more you understand it. And that's really what it's talking about. It was so good. It was so, so good. But can I just say this book, you know, it, it followed um, the warden where Mr. Harding loses his, or actually vacates his position as warden of the church. This one, he has a chance to get it back. And all the stuff that goes with that. And he, who he is and the choices he makes. I want to be Mr. Harding when I grow up. Can I just say? I think Trollope is highly underrated. The more I read him and the more I understand him. And I, I do, I have realized reading Thorn and reading some of these. I'm going to have to read them a few times to get it. They're one of those books that there's a lot of richness and depths and layers that I don't understand. Like in that one in case I forget to mention it in Dr. Thorne 
Hello, Mr. Jet. How you doing? Starting to go away again. <laughs> but in case I forget to mention it, in Dr. Thorne, there's this big area of political stuff that I totally, I, I didn't grasp it. I couldn't figure out why it's in here. What am I not getting? I have a feeling I read it three or four more times. Suddenly I'll go, oh, this is why this is also very important. Because when I was reading it, I, didn't, I, just, I just didn't get it. So there's that. Then I listened to another audio book, A Call to Embrace by Marianne Landers. And this book, I gave it four stars. Wasn't a huge fan of the narrator. That was part of my problem with it. It's more like a three and a half with the narrator. This book, it's an important book. I think more books need to be written dealing with it. So in this book, you have a, a young wife. She has a little girl. She has a controlling husband. And she's, she's not a Christian. She is, um, has rejected her grandmother's God. And she's, her husband has been unfaithful to her. And so she has retaliated and been unfaithful. Now she's pregnant and determined to get an abortion. That's, that's the premise of this book. And then it's who she meets and what happens and what God puts in the way and how things come together and the way God's family helps her and the way what she expects from them and what they don't do and all the things that come together how you know her relationship with her husband as she has run away from him all this stuff is taking place in this book and it was really good unfortunately there were a few spots and I don't know that I would have noticed it as much if I had been reading maybe I would maybe I wouldn't there were definitely a few spots where it got preachy. Too much for me. And I, I like rich, deep discussions of theology. But she also goes from, you know, her grandmother was a Christian. And so she was somewhat familiar with some churches. But she goes from not being confident on how to pray and apologizing to God if her prayer wasn't, you know, articulate enough or worded the right way. She goes from that to just a couple days later you would think that she'd been in church her whole life and she has the lingo and I it just it, it didn't work for me but the story is important enough and rich enough that um I'm gonna read more by her you know it's I I, I it's not that I have a problem with her because I don't I really loved it she you get a lot of Alaska in this book and in all of her books the author is from Alaska and we get it all so I Definitely recommend the book, but will real war if will warn you if you don't like preachiness in books, there is some. And uh in some ways it kind of fits it it feels almost like an evangelistic novel. Not sorry I read it, loved it, and yet didn't love parts of it. I think I'll go with that. And then I read <clears throat> the Tangled Tale of the Wool Gathering Castoffs. I don't know what I gave this. Let me look and see. Yeah, I ended up giving it four stars. In some ways, I actually like this book better. I actually, in some ways, I actually enjoyed it better. But I think the other is a better book. And, um... That I kind of had a, a little bit of a problem with. But for the most part, I love the book. I, I physically read this one. I listened to the other one. Physically read this one. Glad I read it. The stories in here, there's some really good lessons in here. And they're done in a really neat way. Um, if you read the book, pay attention to flirting. Because that was pretty cool. Also... how hard it is on families who are dealing with family members with dementia and you know some of the things that happened in this book we've seen firsthand in our family and so I totally got it um, but the story is is beautiful you know there there are there's a, so one of the gals from the, the first book, Rose, you know, she's part of that uh, prayer shawl ministry. Well, they start one in the retirement home that she lives in, and they're making these shawls specifically for uh, family members who have someone in the memory care unit. 
and so they all get together. There's a, a man who is learning to knit, and um, there are a couple of other, there's one lady who crochets, she doesn't knit, and then there's a lady that comes in to see her mom, and her mom just doesn't recognize her, and she's just very cold and polite, but cold. And, but then she springs knitting and suddenly the mom is engaging with her, still doesn't recognize her, but remembers knitting. And so, but then the granddaughters are, are there and one is having a great time with grandma. The other is hurt by grandma. And so spends time with these older women and this older man and how that affects them. But then there's this really sweet man, bless his heart. He comes in every Monday and brings red carnations for his wife. They're his favorites. But the wife is freaking out every time she sees him. And so he can't see her. He can just check in and make sure she's okay and it's killing him. It's just killing him that she doesn't remember him and that she's afraid of him. She's terrified of him. And then he sees that there is, some, there is another patient there who is flirting with her. And she's the wife and the wife is okay with it. The wife doesn't remember she's married, you know. And so there's all that pain that goes in that and then everything that goes with it. Um, and then, you know, just how different relationships form and grow and, and it's just beautiful. Okay. Can I just say it's just, it's a beautiful story. I loved it. I, I don't think it's as good as the first one per se. But I do think I may have even enjoyed it more than the first one. Can't I can't be sure. I did kind of miss the napkins <laughs> on the first book. So, but yeah, uh, Sharon Mondragon, I'm dying to see what she's going to do next. You know, where is she going to take it? Again, with this one, this is another one that in that first book and in this one, there are these moments where God talks to someone not comfortable with it in this one like I was in Emma. So... There's that, you know, for what that's worth. And then, then I finished A Savior is Risen. It was an Easter devotional by Susan Hill, which you cannot find her name anywhere. It took me forever to find her name. Um, it's crazy. It's not on the cover anywhere. But it's 40 days. It's kind of a Lent sort of thing. And it's just got, it's a beautiful book. So it has... Um, Lots of photographs and then some artsy kind of things. Um, but there, it's just like a word for each day. I was reading, you know, three and four a day, depending on whatever. But so, you know, you have communion and grace and mission, service, anticipate, fasting, reconciliation, sacrifice, Lament. So there are lots and lots of different, um, just, it's about a page and a half for each one. Actually, by the time you take up the, the top part of the page, it's about a page, really, for each one. Super simple. N there's nothing earth shatteringly new in here at all. But this is one of those books that has those quiet reminders of things that we know, but we need to keep reminding ourselves there's a scripture, she offers a prayer. And just a few words to remind you of what is true about God. And, you know, all, all connected to that coming Passion Week and during Passion Week. So, it, I, I'm not sorry, Red. I think I gave it four stars. Did I get four? Yeah. You know, nothing earth shattering. Nothing like I must read this every year. But I will definitely do it again, you know. Three or four years from now, I'll do it again, and you know, several years after that, because again, they're they're good reminders. So it was, I'm glad I had it. So yeah, that's a few books, but you know, not too shabby, and then some audios. But it was it was a good reading month, and uh, the second half especially, I thought was was pretty great. I mean, because that's half the month, you know. Then I read all those other books that I've already talked about, because yeah. So what'd you read? Have you read any of these? Have you read any of the ones that I've asked about? Like the next um, momentous events in the life of a uh, cactus? Or what about uh, Michelle, Mon I want to say Mondragon, it's not like Malagorian or something like that. Um, Magorian. 
have have you read anything else by her that I need to read? I, I, I inquiring minds want to know. Name that commercial. But <laughs> So anyway, um, yeah, I will be back. We've got some fun stuff coming, and uh, you have a good week.